Well, we are starting a new series today entitled Bold as a Lion. We're talking about overcoming temptation with the righteousness of Christ. And here's the reality you need to know off the top as we talk about temptation is that everybody experiences temptation. Everybody here in this room watching online is in a fight every single day called temptation. And so I can just free some of you guys right now. James 1 says, when you are tempted, not if you are tempted. Jesus Christ, the the son of God, was tempted 40 days in the wilderness. And so we can just free each other right now. There's no posturing. There's no pretense. There's no acting like we don't struggle, acting like we're not in a fight. We are. And here's why we acknowledge that. This is very important. We don't acknowledge that all of us are facing temptation. So we can be like, well, I guess everybody's doing it and it's overcoming everybody. And so why not just give into it? No, no, no. We acknowledge that we're in the fight so we can see how to win in the fight. So we can band together like, hey, if you're in the fight and I'm in the fight, let's lock arms together and let's overcome in this fight together instead of acting like it doesn't exist. Amen? So that's what we're going to talk about over the next four weeks in this series. And the the launching pad for us is Proverbs 28, verse 1. It says this, that the wicked flee even though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And as I thought about this summer, our sermon series for the fall and all these different things, that verse just kept hitting me over the head. The righteous are as bold as a lion. And and here's the reality. I think if we did a poll today and said, hey, how many of you want to be bold in life? How many of you want to walk in confidence and freedom in life? Everybody would say, like, absolutely sign me up for that. But then if I asked you a follow-up question to say, how many of you are doing that right now? You might say, well, it's a different season right now. It's a little bit difficult. Well, I was, I have good days and bad days. I mean, there was a season in my life where I was really following Jesus passionately, boldly, with confidence, but not so much. It's been a dry season. I don't know if you know there's a pandemic. I've been kind of isolated. There's some politics. There's some polarization. There's some racism, and it's kind of all got me down, and I'm not as confident or as free or as bold as I once was. And the reality is if we dug up underneath some of those things, it wouldn't just be the pandemic. It wouldn't just be some dry seasons. There would be some temptations that you're giving into, that you're not overcoming, that they have overcome you. And some of you right now, as soon as I say that, you know what that is. You know what sin that is. You know what temptation that is. And so we want to talk about how how do we fight it? How do we overcome it? Not ourselves, but in the righteousness of Christ by the power of the Spirit. And so we're going to take four weeks uh, to really dive into that. Today's uh, talk is going to be titled this. It's Discovering Overcoming. Discovering Overcoming. Some of us need to just discover that you can overcome. You can be bold. This temptation doesn't have to have a stronghold over your life. Right? And some of us need to hear that today. And so we're going to talk about what that looks like. I'd love for you to take this out. Let me know you got it. We have a, a study guide for you to go through. Do you, did you guys get this when you walked in? Three of you. Okay, yeah. And the rest of you are now, okay, you got it. Okay, if you didn't get one, grab it on your way out. Uh, just simple place for notes. You can get out and take notes if you can fully engage in this time, as well as some midweek, midweek reflections so you can get the most out of this series. So please take advantage of that. Uh, and then here's point one, as you're taking notes in your new study journal that's so fancy. Here's point one. It's be aware, if we're going to overcome temptation, here's how we do it. Be aware of the plot behind temptation. Now, we face temptation every single day, right? And some of us uh, look at temptation and we see, okay, the the idea for temptation is uh, I see it, uh, I'm allured by it, it looks attractive, it looks nourishing, and if I give into it, then I sin, and it hurts me and it hurts other people, right? Like temptation, you know this, right, is not a sin, but when you give in to that temptation, that's where the sin happens. It's, and some of us, like you've heard that, you kind of know that, even just like common sense, you know that. But, and so you might say like the plot behind temptation, like Tim, the plot behind temptation is to give in to it. That's the scheme, to give in to it, to sin, hurt myself and other people. But as we look at the Bible, it's bigger than that. We see that in the first temptation ever in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Listen to what it says. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? 
You see, in the very beginning, God says, hey, you can have everything. Adam and Eve, all of my creation, I want you to enjoy it. I want good things for you. Some of you, you heard Michael, God wants your joy. And you're like, I don't know if he wants my joy. God wants your joy. Psalm 16 says, at the right hand of God are pleasures forevermore. There is joy with God. God God wanted Adam and Eve to experience the joy of all of his creation, to experience what, what true fullness was like. But he said, hey, this one tree, that's not it. Don't eat of that tree. The servant comes along. What's the first thing he says? Try this apple? No. He says, don't trust God. Did you see it? Did God actually say? Are you sure God wants good for you? Are you sure God wants your joy? Are you sure God wants your fullness? Maybe he's holding out on you. And maybe you need to go outside of his plan to experience joy and fullness. And you need to know the crafty serpent, Satan, his plot is still the same today. It looks different, but it's still the same today. You think about sex or or lust. and As you see that sex or lust in your life, as you are tempted to give into that temptation, it's not just about like click here or look at this image or, or look too long at this person of the opposite sex or, or have sex with this other person who, who's not your spouse. It's not simply about that action. It's about allegiance. And some, especially with something like sexual sin, like, no, it's not. No, it's about the action. That's, do you really trust God? Did God really say sex and marriage between a man and a woman, that that's where fullness is and that's where joy is and that's God's design? When you you see a distortion of that adultery, lust, the temptation, the plot behind it is to say, I don't know if God really knew what he was talking about with marriage. I think I need to step outside of that for fullness. I think variety, that's where it's at. That's the plot. Every single time you're tempted in that way, there's a greater plot. It's not just a click. It's not just a look. It's not just an experience. There's a plot behind that temptation. Satan hasn't changed. He's still doing the same thing. And my question is, do you even know that? Are you aware of that? See, some of you, it's not, it's not lust or uh, adultery. It's not that that you're tempted to. It's money, materialism, and, and greed. And you need to know, hey, it's not just the greed of like, I want that object. I want those possessions. I, I want to, to get ahead and work. And if it's to the detriment of my coworkers, that's fine as long as I get mine. It's not just about that action. It's about allegiance. It's about, did, is God going to take care of you? Do you trust him to take care of you, or do you have to take it into your own hands? Uh, Does God care about your family or your future? Did God really say he's for you? Oh, maybe not. So selfish ambition, greed, that's where I'm going to go for fulfillment. It's more than an action. It's an issue of allegiance. See, if you're taking notes, and I know all of you are, if you're taking notes in your fancy journal, you should write this down. Here's a definition for temptation. It's the invitation to trust someone or something over and above God. That's what temptation is. Is To get you to sin? Yeah. But it's bigger than that. It's about who you, are you going to trust that sin? Are you going to trust yourself? Or are you going to trust God? So my question is, are you aware of that? Are you aware of that plot literally uh, just, English majors, whatever, like the definition of plot. I looked it up. It's a secret, harmful plan. That's the plot behind temptation, right? And we need to be, if we're going to overcome it, we have to be aware of it. I I saw this really, really vividly the other day. I was at a crosswalk in downtown Phoenix. Our office for the church is downtown, so I'm there a lot. I'm at a lot of crosswalks. And some of you, I know, have been at some crosswalks as well. There's different ways to walk across a, a crosswalk, right? There's the, the, the way nobody really does. Like when the, the walk symbol comes on, you just walk across. Nobody does that. That's crazy, right? There's the way I see a lot downtown is people who live downtown, work downtown, and they're just like, they see the, 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 the sign that says, don't walk, and they're just like, <laughs> that's funny. And they just walk like a boss. 
across that street. And they're like, I don't care about the light rail. I don't care about the traffic. And you see it. They're just like, that strut going across. And I'm, I'm kind of amazed, like in awe at this. I'm like, look at him go. No fear. Right? And that's one way to walk across the crosswalk. Another way, and a lot of you have probably experienced that, this is to, to get kind of caught up with the other person you're speaking with, and you kind of forget you're waiting to walk across, and you kind of forget, and you're a little bit out in the street, and a car like zooms right by you, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's, let's take a step back. That was kind of scary. There's a reason why they have these signs. Like, I'm so thankful for the city of Phoenix, right? Like, all of you think that when you're at a crosswalk. Um, and you kind of like, you get brushed back by a car, and you're like, oh, goodness, and you take a step back. But listen, the other day at a crosswalk, I saw neither one of those things. I saw something I have never seen before. I saw three elderly people, and they were like, and I don't know if y'all can get this on video, but they were like three feet out in the street. And they were having a great time at the crosswalk, right? They were laughing and <laughs> mucking it up together and just talking. They were totally focused on one another and these three elderly people. And it's, it's not, the walk sign is not on and they're three feet out in the street and like traffic is coming. It didn't stop for them. And it's like whizzing by them and they're elderly. And I'm thinking like, how elderly? Like how many of your senses are functioning? Like eyes, can you see the cars? Like, ears, can you hear the light rail? Like, beep, 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 beep. Like, your, your sense of, of feeling? Like, did you feel like the rearview mirror just kind of brushed by your elbow? <laughs> like, I'm just telling it was like that. Now, by God's grace, the light came on to walk, and, and they made it uh, without dying. Uh, thank God for that, right? But, but as I thought about that, I thought, man, how many of us, that's ridiculous. We hear that, we're like, what are you doing? You're going to get hit by a car. Don't you understand? And how many of us, we think that's ridiculous at a crosswalk, but we do that all the time in life. You're just meandering through life, just three feet out in the road. Ah, this is fun. This sex, it's not going to hurt anybody. Hey, this, this lie, it's just a little white lie. This is fine. Whew. Whew. Just cars blow them. And, and some of y'all, like, you have some friends that are doing that, and you're like, hey, come back here. You're about to get hit by a car. And some of us, man, in life, we just walk through life, and we're not even aware of the plot behind temptation, that someone is trying to take you out by trusting someone or something over and above God. Are you aware of the plot behind temptation in your life? Here's the second thing. If we're going to overcome temptation, we have to become an expert in the path of temptation. An expert in the path of temptation. James 1, 14 through 15 says it this way, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. James says there's a path to temptation. Here's how it works. It starts with desire. It leads to sin, and that sin eventually leads to death. And he compares it. James gives a lot of illustrations. He compares it to a life cycle. He says it's like conception and growing up to become a, a full adult. And James is showing us, hey, hey, sin never ends where it begins. See, here's the fallacy we often believe with temptation. If I will give in to this pride, if I will give in to this gossip, if I will, it's so easy to write this on Facebook, if I will give in to this slander, like I gotta say something, if I will give in to this, this temptation is so strong, and if I will give in to it, there will be a release. I'll feel better. I'll experience freedom. False. How does temptation work? James tells us, you give in to that desire, there's not freedom, there is bondage. You give in to that desire, you don't experience feeling better, you start to slowly die. Now some of you think, well, Tim, I, I sin all the time and I'm, I'm alive, I'm here today, I'm not dead. Yeah, but part of you dies. Something dies. Every time, this is, the, this is the life cycle of sin. This is the path of sin. Every time something in you dies. Maybe it's just fellowship with God. Maybe it's your marriage. A slow death. There's unresolved conflict. There's lack of forgiveness. There's resentment. You've given into those sins. 
And just slowly, like, we don't pursue each other anymore. I don't even know if she loves me anymore. It's a slow death in your, your marriage. For some of you, your integrity is dying. Who you are in public is not even close to who you are in private. For a lot of us, again, the, the series title, your boldness is dying. There's that temptation. It's got you. Its hook is in you. And you think, man, I I used to love Jesus. I used to be one of those people that was raising their hands in worship. I used to be getting to the Bible study. Even if I had other things going on, like I would make sacrifices. I would, I remember, like I remember in college, I remember newly married. I remember I wanted to study God's word. I remember I wanted to fight that temptation. I remember I wanted to share the gospel with my neighbor. And now I just think all that stuff is silly and I'm in church and I'm going through the motions because that's what I do. But you remember a time where you were bold and passionate about God and his mission on the earth. And if you're honest, you've fallen asleep at the wheel in the Christian life. And you don't have that anymore. And you're drifting. And if you dig up the roots, it's, it's that temptation that you thought was just a momentary decision. No, it's a destiny. It's putting you on a path. And James is going to point it out. Hey, that sin, it never ends where it begins giving way to it, it's not freedom, it's bondage. It's not life, it's death. And and I'm here to tell you today, you need to become an expert in how that works. You know why? Because Satan already is. Because your flesh already is. Because the world, they're experts in this path. Are you? Do you know how it works? See, In the text, it says we're tempted, but it doesn't just say tempted. It says we're lured and enticed by his own desire. Lured and enticed. That's hunting. That's fishing imagery. There's a lure. Like I I grew up in East Texas, and I fished a lot. My parents had land. I would fish on ponds, and I had a tackle box full of lures, and, and they were all different. Like to his own desire. They were all different. Like some of them are for bass. Some of them are for trout. Some of them are for crappie. Some of them, I'm revealing how hick I am apparently in group in Texas, right? Some are like, what is he talking about? Uh, but I grew, I grew up fishing and I had all these different lures for different fish. And guess what? All the lures, like they're really pretty. Like my kids, even today, we'll go fishing like Indian Still Park and all those kinds of things and, and places like urban fishing, right? We're, we're hipster too, not hick. Um, and um, they'll, they're, they love the, 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 the lures, and they love getting them out. Like, this one spins, this one's this color. This is so fun. But I have to always tell them, guys, be careful. Why? Because behind the flashy colors and the spinners, there's a what? There's a hook. It's really sharp. Yeah. In fact, if you look at fishing, it's kind of cruel. Like, those lures are lies. <laughs> we are lying to fish, people. <laughs> right? Because we're showing them, hey, so here's something attractive. Here's the desire. Here's, this is going to help you. This is going to free you. This lust, this pride, this gossip, this greed. Man, just take hold. It's okay. Nobody's watching. It's acceptable. Everybody screams at everybody these days. It's okay. Be angry. Slander people. This is the way of the world. Just take it. It's yours. It's attractive. It's nourishing. But there's a hook. <laughs> Gives birth to sin. It eventually leads to death. And it starts to kill your integrity. It starts to kill your impact. It starts to kill your marriage. And some of you, man, you're like, this isn't ancient history in my life. This is right now. You need to become an expert in the path. Listen, you know, like Facebook and Netflix and Google, we all get frustrated by this, but we still use all these platforms. They have amazing algorithms. Anybody? Uh, they know you, so you go to one site one time and then you get ads flooded to you for that thing, right? And you're like, why are they do? how do they do this? Like, where's my privacy? And they're like, Instagram. <laughs> like, it doesn't stop you from doing it. You're just mad about it. So this summer, here, here's what I experienced is some of you know I was on sabbatical this summer. Sabbatical is a lot about resting, but it's also a little bit about wrestling, 
like wondering, like, God, would you have me do this or would you have me do this? And, and recalibrating, should I add more of this? Should I remove more of this? And one of the most significant pieces of that for me of like, should I do this or that is uh, should I grow this beard? <laughs> I was struggling with it. I was supposed to be resting, but I was wrestling about the beginning of July. I was like, if I was ever going to grow a beard, now would be the time. Because nobody has to see like this jacked up, like patchy face, right? And I'm not going to be on stage. And so I would just go back and forth like, should I, Jaya? And she's like, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but I did anyway. And um, listen, we were, as I was debating this, we were in Florida, Swampville, Florida, at the beginning of July. Worst decision I ever made to grow a beard at that time in that season. Right? Because I'm walking around with my family, supposed to be on vacation, enjoying this. And all, I'm just like, oh, this hurts. Oh, it feels like my face is on fire, right? Those first couple of weeks, you know what I'm talking about, Ben. Do you remember those days? When you're first growing out a beard, and it's just like, oh, I don't think, how do people do this? And so I, in a moment of weakness, I went on Amazon and I said, I need some beard cream. And I always thought that was kind of lame, just to be honest with you. But I was like, I need something to help, like, soothe this. And let me just say, I bought some beard cream. It did help. But the next three weeks, I got invited to join beard clubs on Amazon. I got invited to, to, to submit to a subscription on Amazon for my, my beard and maintaining it. I got invited to buy beard supplements. I didn't even know that was a thing. Right? The next three weeks, Satan, your flesh, the world, they got a better algorithm than that. They, they know where you're weak. They know what is just going to be an excuse for you. They know what you're going to minimize. They know about the food, the sex, the substance. They, they know. Right? Do you know? Will you be honest enough to admit what that is for you? Satan knows. The world, they, they got the algorithm figured out. The question is, do you know? Do you know that path? Hey, if I give in to this, this is where it's going to lead. You know what that is. You need to be an expert in that. You need to see downstream past the pleasure and see the pain. If I say this, if I do this, if I lash out, this is going to give birth to this. And my marriage is at stake. And my legacy is at stake. And my life is at stake. And my witness is at stake. And my relationships are at stake. And do you see that path? And do you know it? And listen, I know some of y'all are like, I'm listing out things like lies and lust and gossip and, and greed. And you're like, I thank God I don't struggle with those things. I mean, just be honest. And you're privately judging everybody in the room. You're like, this doesn't apply to me. Listen, you struggle with a different sin. It's called religious pride. And Jesus, man, he had some of the harshest words for those people and those sinners. He called them whitewashed tombs. Yeah, everything may look good on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. You got some respectable sins that our culture wouldn't even say is a sin, like gossip or slander or anger. But, but you're just as sinful in your heart. Do you know your path? Do you know what the lure is for you? Satan does. The world does. It's got an algorithm on you. If you're going to overcome temptation, you got to be honest and just say, here's, here's where I'm weak. Maybe you write that down right now. Maybe you write the question down right now. And you say, I'm going to go back. I'm going to think through this. I'm going to pray through this. Where am I weak? What's that for you? Last thing. If we're going to overcome temptation, we have to take hold of God's provision to overcome the temptation. We have to take hold of God's provision. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I love it. Look at the text with me. Again, it says, we have the character of God, he's faithful, but we also have the commitment of God. Because he's faithful, he's going to provide a way of escape. He's going to provide a door. Yes, there is a path to destruction in your temptation and in your sin. There is a lure that's meant for you. It's custom made for you, but God has also custom made a door, a way out, a way of escape. Why? 
he's faithful. That commitment, we can be assured of that commitment because it's part of God's character. He's faithful. Some of you need to hear this today. Some of you, you've had the hook in so long. You're like, Tim, I don't see a door for me. Like in this pride, I, I just, the way I am, this gossip, I just speak my mind. I don't see the door. I can't help it. This materialism, this greed, I just, I, I can't stop buying things. And you're like, I don't see the door. And the hook's been in so long. All you can see is the lure. And you can't see the door. And God brought you here today to remind you, it stems from the character of God. You can trust him. He's faithful. Therefore, he still provides the door. You need to see it. And you can see it now. That's why you're here this morning is to see, although there is a door, I can walk through it. Some of you need to know, in the midst of your temptation, just, if you haven't already, think about what that is. Some of you are like, I can't think about that in church. (laughs) It's okay, right now, you can think about it, okay? Think about your temptation, the one you struggle with. Maybe it is religious pride, maybe it's lying, maybe it's gossip, maybe it's greed, maybe it's pride, selfishness, comfort. Whatever that is for you. And I want you to think about that and picture that and and hear this spoken over your life right now. That in the midst of that temptation, you know the one you're thinking about. God still loves you. He's still for you. And he's making a way right now for you to overcome it. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? What's the plot behind temptation? That's not true. I can't trust God. He's not faithful. He doesn't have that kind of character. He is holding out on me. He doesn't know how weak I am. He doesn't, this hook has been stuck. It's been stuck for 15 years and 50 years. There's no way out of this. That's a lie. That's the plot of the crafty, deceptive servant. And in the name of Jesus, by the power of his spirit, by the faithfulness of our father, you need to know no failure in your temptation can overcome the faithfulness of your father. And you got to take hold of that today. There's not multiple options. This isn't a multiple choice quiz. Like, do I take hold of God's faithfulness? Do I take hold of the doorway out of temptation? Or do I do these other things? No, no, no. It's the sin or the savior. It's the pain or the provision. Everybody's in this fight. Are you going to take hold of the faithfulness of God, of the doorway out of this thing. He's making it available to you. He wants you. God's not shaming you over your temptation. He wants to set you free from it. One of the first things Jesus gives his like public declaration, his purpose statement in the gospel of Luke. And one of the things he says is, I came. Here's why Jesus came. To set the captive free. That's, that's why it came. There's a door. Even if you don't see it, the hook's been so long. There's a door open. God's for you, even in the midst of your temptation. Listen, you're going to need to take hold of it. There's several ways we can take hold of this. There's several doors that God has made available. The word of God, the spirit of God, the people of God. We're going to talk about all that over the next four weeks. But I would just say this for today. Some of you guys, the hook is not in your mouth. It's in your eye. You ever been fishing? Sometimes it's traumatizing. Some of y'all. You ever been fishing and the hook doesn't get caught in the mouth? It's caught in the eye. You can't see. And some of you, if you're honest, you're like, well, Tim, I'm, I think I'm doing okay. I mean, I struggle just like everybody else. I mean, there's things and there's a world we live in. It's kind of crazy. And like, yeah, I mean, I, every once in a while, like, I'm not perfect. You say imperfect people moved by the perfect love of Jesus. Like, I'm imperfect. Like, yeah, I mean, that, that's me. And, and you're like, I think I'm doing okay. And you're like, my mouth is clean. But you have a hook in your eye. You can't even, and the hook is so deep and it's in your eye. You can't even see it anymore. And so you don't just need the word of God, the spirit of God, You need the people of God to help you pull it out. How many of you have been fishing and you caught the fish and it was coming in and the fish spit the hook out of his mouth? If that's happened to you, report it to the Guinness Book of World Records, right? 
the news. Like somebody will run that story. Why? Because that doesn't happen. I know not all of y'all from Texas, but it doesn't happen. They don't spit it out. Somebody else has to get it out. You have to take some pliers to the thing, depending on how hook, the hook is set in there. We need other people. We need the church of Jesus Christ to come alongside us and say, man, that, that hook seems deep. That seems painful. Can I help you with that? Can we walk? Hey, actually, my hook is slightly different. My bait is different, but I got a similar one in my life. Can we, can we meet for coffee and talk about that and hold each other accountable? Can we pray for one another? We're all in this fight. Can we fight it together? The other day I was at uh, Piestawa Peak and I was coming down from the top, from the summit, and I had my ear pods in, noise canceling, right, because I don't want to talk to anybody <laughs> on the hike. And uh, just a little ways down, there's this guy and he's trying to talk to me. And so I'm like, okay, take the, <laughs> I'm just being honest in church, right? I take the ear pods out and he's like, hey, which way is down? Like, how do you get out of here? And I was like, hey, you take this left and you go around and then you'll see some bars. It's really clear. And you'll start to make your way down. If you've hiked past a peak, you know that that is the case. And I could kind of see some doubt in his face when I said that. Like, I don't know if it was because of my physique or I don't look like a hiker. He was kind of like, I don't know. And I saw him. He didn't take a left. He kind of started walking to the right. You need to know, to the right, it's just the way down. Like, it's like a cliff. You just roll down that way. There's no path. And so I'm kind of watching him, making sure he doesn't die. And I walk down a little bit further, and he says, hey, bud, again, I'm so sorry. I can't see. And it's, there's a sign up there, but it seems like there's no trail. I, I'm confused. And finally, I just, again, <laughs> AirPods out. And I was like, bro, just come with me. Let's go together. And so we went down together. And it was exactly as I said. The rails, it was all there, right? I'm a hiker. I know what I'm talking about. And so we walk down together. Listen, some of you, you're trying to figure out the way out by yourself. You're trying to get the hook out by yourself. You're squirming around, white knuckling this thing and this sex and this lust and this possessions and my obsessions with my possessions. And, and it's all in there. And you're just like, I just get it. It's going to, I just give me a few more weeks, Tim. I know I've had 20 years of this same sin, but just give me a few more. I'm just going to get it out. I don't have to tell anybody. I don't have to walk with people. That would be embarrassing. That would be awkward. I'm just going to get it out by myself. And you're, you're excusing it, and you're white-knuckling it, and you're close-fisting it. And you need somebody else to say, no, no, no. Here's the way. Let's go together. There's a door out. It's right there. Let's go together. I can't see it. I'm not sure. This is scary. Yeah, I love you. Let's go together. Jesus loves us. We love each other. Let's fight this battle together. And so we're going to talk about a lot of doors, lots of ways of escape. The first step today is just not to do this alone. How many of you are trying to do this thing alone and it's not working? Just be honest. It's not working. The hook just gets deeper. And some of you, God brought you here today to show you that. If you keep this up, your marriage is going to die. You keep this up, your integrity is going to die. You keep this up, your boldness, it's dying. And God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to be as bold as a lion. He wants to, to use you. He wants to ex ex you to experience his fullness and joy and be used by him to help others do the same. That's God's plan for your life. Don't let pretense or posturing or pride stop you from experiencing that because you're too prideful to admit, I'm in this fight and I need help. I'm in this fight and I can't do it by myself. So we need to lock arms together. And so that's my invitation to you. Here, here's how we're going to do that. We're going to close, we're going to stand, and we're going to sing. But we're going to do something I talked about a couple weeks ago. We're going to open up the altar. And there's going to be people down here, myself, Pastor AC, to pray with you. People that you can partner with. And just say, I need help. I, I don't have this nailed down. I thought I did, but the hook is deep and I need help. We're going to sign up for a community group. We have a community group class. It starts next Sunday here. Let us know. We'd love to sign you up for that. We have starting point. Some of you, the most spiritual overcoming decision and temptation right now, stay for starting point. Meet some other people. Don't do this on your own. Some of you, the most spiritual, courageous, bold way to fight temptation is come to the Men's Connect night tomorrow night. Don't be alone. Meet somebody else. 
Some of you, we have these PBC nights once a month for the rest of the fall. This month, we're going to talk about singleness and dating on the 27th, right here, Monday night. My wife and I are going to speak into that and talk about how there's temptations with that kind of stuff. How do we cling to God's truth? How do we do that? How do we navigate single and dating well? We're going to do parenting in October, married in November. So excited to equip you that there's a way out. There's a way to follow Jesus. There's a way to overcome temptation. Some of you, the most spiritual overcoming thing you could do, come to the altar, sign up for one of those things, come to a connect night, stay for starting point, and lock arms with other people, and not just face the battle of temptation, but overcome it in Jesus' name. Amen? Don't dismiss that. That's, that's the response here before you. Will you take hold of God's provision? So we're going to open up the altar, and I invite you to come. If you need to sit where you are, you don't feel comfortable with that, and you're like, I, I'm not, uh, I was going to say I'm not Baptist. That's rude, though, maybe. Uh, I grew up in a Baptist church, and we did altar calls, and maybe that's why I didn't do them for a while, and now I'm back into it. So thank you, Baptist church. Um, maybe you're like, I don't know if I could do that. Just stay where you are. Sit down and pray. Write in your journal. But maybe some of you, I mean, it happened in the first service. There was people coming down to the altar and being set free. There's people praying with your pastors, myself and AC, and, and starting to experiencing freedom. There's people praying to receive Christ for the first time because you can't fight this temptation by yourself. You need the righteousness of Christ to do it through you. Amen? Some of you don't have the Holy Spirit. You need to come receive the Spirit of God so you can win in this fight. And so I'm going to pray, and then I would invite you to come. Let's pray together. Father in heaven. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is a sword to fight this battle of temptation. And God, I pray that we would fight it. I pray that we would take hold of your provision. God, I pray that we would become experts in the path, be aware of where we're weak. And we would begin to fight and we would begin to overcome the temptations in our lives by your spirit and the name of your son, Jesus and God, we wouldn't wait to be in bondage one more second, one more day, and have a slow death of our integrity, or of our marriage, of our finances, or whatever it may be, or our fellowship with you, God. You would, you would bring freedom. I know you want to do it. I just pray that we would respond to it and take hold of it. So God, I pray for some people, that means right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just telling you right now, stop listening to me and telling you, Jesus, I, I need you. I need your Holy Spirit. I don't have it. I've been coming to church and going through the motions. But I'm trying to do this thing on my own. And God, I pray for those men and women right now. They would just tell you, Jesus, I believe in you. You lived a perfect life. You died the perfect death in my place for my sin. And you rose again to give me victory. And that they would come down and, and let us know that so we can help walk with them. God, I pray for the Christians in the room who would say, no, I have the Holy Spirit. I know Jesus, but I've grown cold, distant. That there's things in my life that are slowly dying. My marriage is in that place. My friendships are in that place. My fellowship with God just feels dry. And they would come to the altar and just confess that, and you would renew their spirit. They would talk to a pastor and just we get to pray together and be with one another to help overcome the temptation in our lives. God, we pray for that now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, you can stand and sing with us now. Let's stand together. And as you feel led, come. We'd love to pray with you.